All right, well, it's wonderful to be back on stage. Thank you uh, all for coming back uh, this afternoon and, and joining. Um, as Sumbul mentioned, I spend a lot of my time these days and for the last decade doing genomics. I'm, I'm going to try and give a whole talk now without mentioning genomics once, so you can throw something at me if I hit genomics. We're going to talk about my heart counts, or rather, your heart counts, because that's the, the key part and the key message that we want to put across. I have these disclosures. I'm going to start with this picture. This is a picture of my beautiful wife and her sister. I'm going to start with that partly because uh, she took her kids to uh, daycare this morning, allowing me to be here with you, so thank you for that, Fiona. Uh, but her sister, uh, sitting, uh, standing next to her there just outside our house here in California, um, lives here. Her sister's called Mary. Well, I should be clear that she doesn't actually live here because that's Edinburgh Castle in Scotland, and she doesn't actually live in the castle because not everyone who lives in Scotland lives in a castle. But she does... Uh, live in Edinburgh, uh, and you might think that people in Scotland sit uh, around eating haggis all day long, and if you don't know what haggis is, then you should go Google it and uh, never eat it again, probably, if you have before. But actually, it turns out that in Edinburgh, they have some pretty nice food these days, including a Michelin-starred restaurant. And in December of last year, you're wondering where I'm going here, aren't you? Well, in December of last year, uh, my wife and I were sitting down because we thought we should buy Mary and her husband, Stuart, a Christmas gift. We thought, wouldn't it be nice if we bought them you know, a voucher for a meal at this uh, lovely restaurant, the kitchen. And so we did that, and I went through the website, Modern Technology, hit go, and just at that moment, my thigh vibrated. That's an unusual sensation, and if you're a, a physician or if you're in the healthcare business and your thigh vibrates, only one of two things is happening. Either your pager is going off, or you have phantom vibration syndrome. You may have read about this in the BMJ a little while back. 70% of residents reported phantom vibrations when they had a device that wasn't vibrating, they felt that their thigh was vibrating. Anyway, as it turned out, my thigh was vibrating because a device in my pocket just vibrated that was triggered by trying to buy uh, this particular gift for my sister-in-law and her husband. And, and when I learned, picked up my phone, this is what it was. It was a fraud alert from Chase. And specifically, it said, hey, it looks like you're trying to buy something in Scotland. Why are you doing that? You don't normally do that. Uh, I'm not sure that that's right. Uh, did you really mean to do that? And here's a big red uh, button to say, no, it wasn't me, I don't, don't do that. And a, and a big green button to say, yes, that was me. Uh, it was you. Go ahead, uh, authorize this. And the point, I hope, is clear to you. If my credit card company can monitor my behavior the whole time, decide what's normal for me and what's abnormal for me, and ping me if I'm doing something that's not normal for me, and maybe I should buy more gifts for my you know, sister-in-law, maybe that's the theme here, um, but buying gifts in Scotland is not normal for me, is that, is that okay? If, the, if my credit card company can do that, then surely my doctor should be able to do that too. And that's what I'd like to talk to you a little bit about over the next few minutes, because this is the revolution that I think we're really in the middle of. Mobile health technology, sensor technology can change the way we treat patients and change the way uh, we, we model and, uh, and uh, work out if, if our patients are healthy or sick. Well, probably not many of you in the audience have one of these. This is the gold-plated Apple Watch. I know Beyonce and Kanye West are two of the people who do own them. If you have a spare $17,000 and you want to pull up the Apple website right now, you can have one uh, for yourself. You probably also don't have one of these, although you will hear from Ram Fish later in this particular session a little bit about the Sami Band uh, and the LED sensors that are on there. Uh, this is a pretty impressive device. He'll show you some more data from it, but this is from data in our own lab here where we're testing the ability of this device uh, to follow heart rate during an exercise test uh, versus uh, clinical grade data in, in our cardiopulmonary exercise testing lab. You might have one of these, probably not yet. This is a tattoo-based blood glucose sensor. So it does something called reverse iontophoresis to look at the interstitial glucose and measure out your glucose and then Bluetooth the answer uh, to your phone. This is a new world we're talking about where we can measure many different things. Even just the accelerometer in your phone is enough to analyze your gait. Maybe you're getting the shuffling gait of a patient with Parkinson's syndrome and you have the early signs of that. The accelerometer itself may be able to detect that early and get you to help so that uh, we can prevent rather than, uh, rather than later try to cure. And this is the Mobilize Center uh, here at Stanford. And you'll hear more about this actually in the BD2K session uh, coming up, I think, uh, tomorrow. Well, while you might not have a gold-plated Apple Watch, it turns out 700 million people in the world have an iPhone, and that's not a small number. Uh, and in fact, it was really at this meeting last year that a few of us started to have conversations uh, with Apple, and at the time we weren't able to say anything about them. But the idea had been formulating at, uh, in Cupertino, just down the road from here, that perhaps the technology that's in these phones could be used to help clinical research. 
and, may, and maybe eventually medicine. But as a stepping stone to that, perhaps these incredibly powerful devices that sit in our pockets and that now increasingly talk to wearable uh, sensors could actually be used to do clinical research in a different way. And this is the A8 chip uh, in the iPhone 6. It has a low power motion sensor inside it and the, the chip before had a similar one. So that if you were walking around and just going about your normal life, uh, without draining your battery too much, your phone or your device can actually work out how physically active you are. And for clinical researchers that have spent years trying to work out how physically active you were in the last week by asking you what did you do last Monday, you know, this is a potential revolution uh, in the making. Well, here is uh, the uh, app that I'm going to tell you a little about over the next uh, little while. And I should mention, I will again at the end, that this is predominantly the work of Michael McConnell from the cardiology department here at Stanford, who has really pushed forward in an amazing way uh, this particular project. But that's not him on stage there. That's actually Jeff Williams from Apple, uh, who was announcing uh, the cardiovascular app just at a spring forward event here uh, uh, down the road in March. Uh, our app was one of the five launch applications for something called Research Kit, which is a software development kit uh, that Apple have released globally and actually made open source uh, for the first time so that anywhere, anywhere, a, a teenager in a bedroom somewhere in uh, rural Africa could potentially code up a research kit application uh, and start doing clinical trials. Well, I mentioned there was uh, technology inside the device. The, the good news is that any technology that's on your phone can now be used for a clinical research trial. You can, for example, make sure the My Heart uh, Counts app, which if you, if you want to download it while I'm talking, you can from the App Store. Uh, you, you have, we have Touch ID available, so if someone picks up your phone, they don't get access to your data. Uh, there's explanations that we spent quite a little bit of time thinking about how to do. And that's one of, I think, the major achievements of pushing this forward. And, and credit to, to Mike and to Anne James and many others here at Stanford and in other institutions for really working out how to do consent on a phone. Because that's something that hasn't been done. Ima imagine if you're in a study right now, you're going to sit down with someone who'll have a one-to-one -one conversation and explain the study, and then you'll have a 17-page uh, uh, form, which is your consent form, and at the end you'll sign it probably in more than one place, because you'll have a HIPAA form and some other form as well. So porting that into, into a phone in a way that is appropriate and safe, uh, it, it was no, no trivial task. But uh, they worked on this over the course of the year. This is uh, the consent that you'll see if you sign up for the study, or you have this um, uh, screen on sensing. There's a screen on what we're going to do with your data, the fact it will be de-identified but held very securely. We will protect it. We will, if you want, to share it with the world, help you share it with the world and contribute as a citizen scientist to the sorts of clinical trials that you've been hearing about uh, this morning at the conference. Uh, and of course, there are benefits and risks to the trial. And the, and the consent form that happens entirely on the phone uh, takes you through all of those. And then you get taken to one more screen where you decide, this is the key thing, you decide how much of your data you want to go to the study. And you slide each one of these across. If you decide tomorrow that you don't want the study knowing your weight anymore, for whatever reason, you slide that back across and it's gone. It's as simple as that. And I think this is a very powerful way to put really the power in the hands of the participant of the, of the trial and really so that we can all participate. So here are the activities for My Heart Counts. We, we'd ask about your well-being and your daily perception. There's a, some sleep questions. There's, there's questions about your diet. We're cardiologists, so we're interested in your risk factors for uh, disease. And then there's a dashboard that will show how physically active you were and give you some, some feedback about how much you, you've done. When, some, when Apple announces something, there's usually quite a lot of attention, and we benefited from this. Uh, in fact, in the first couple of days, 10,000 people signed up for the application. In fact, that was on the back of 25,000 downloads. And so we currently are up to almost 40,000 people. And just to be clear, you know, two months ago, this didn't exist. There was nobody in this study two months ago. And over the course of two weeks in March, 30,000 people signed up. So we're really in, in a new era and one that we don't necessarily understand. I think Kathy mentioned the Precision Meds Initiative was somewhat terrifying. I think that, that we share some of, that, uh, some of that feeling when we think about uh, having a study that's this large that really didn't even particularly exist um, a month ago. Well, what can you do with that? Here's just some of the earliest data, as, as I mentioned from the numbers, we have data on more people than this, but here's physical activity on 18,000 people. And this was you know, two weeks after we launched the app. You can see that the proportion of people who are active, this is the hours during the day that you see at the bottom of the screen. And then if you look at the red, that's the focus of the percentage of people who are physically active. You see, it doesn't get much higher than 25%. So three quarters of the people in the study aren't active even at the most active point in the day. Uh, but you can see little peaks at lunchtime and little peaks at the end of the day. Uh, and, and this is, information is coming, remember, from, from the sensor and the phone. This isn't, what did you do last Monday? This is rather, you know, what is the accelerometer in your phone doing uh, right now? Well, you can also ask questions like this, you know, how happy do you feel today? 
because happiness is an important thing. Well, if we do that and then map it uh, to the US, you can see that there are some parts of the world, like California, deep dark blue, we're very happy here. If you're in Texas, you're pretty happy. If you're in Florida, you're pretty happy. If you're up in the Northeast, remember this was March, there was still a lot of inches of snow that were there uh, from that uh, dark winter. So uh, not quite so happy up in the Northeast. Uh, my most interesting to me though is this North and South Dakota. Did you notice that North Dakota looks pretty happy and South Dakota not very happy at all? Well, I didn't really, I don't know why, why that was, so I googled it and found out that North Dakota has all the oil. So North Dakota really is happier than South Dakota because they make in two days as much oil as South Dakota makes in a whole year. So I didn't know that, but uh, that was interesting. So North Dakota, you can also look at things like how many vegetables do you eat? Of course, people have to report accurately. The Dakotas do pretty well here, don't they? I mean, those South Dakotans might not be happy, but they're eating their vegetables. <laughs> Maybe that's why they're not happy. <laughs> Uh, California not doing quite as well, considering we grow a lot of those vegetables. So um, pretty interesting trends that we see over the, sh the course of a short period of time. We can analyze your sleep. This is actually my youngest son. We put him up beside the whiskey every night. Uh, <laughs> he sleeps like a baby, you know. It's, he's, he's 14 years old now, but he, no, I'm, I'm only kidding. This was him as a newborn. Uh, but we can ask about sleep. And uh, if you ask, here's not a surprising finding, but it's good to see this is real. If we divide by people who go to bed late and go to bed early, and then look at their age, as you might expect, the people who go to bed late are all uh, young, and younger than those who go to bed early. But have a, have a look here and tell me where you lie uh, on this map. Here's life satisfaction against your going to bed and getting up habits, right? So here's when you retire and when you wake. So see, find yourself in this group here. See which column that you fall in and decide how happy you feel with life. Do you go to bed early and then get up late? Do you have lots of sleep? Maybe you stay up too late, but you get up too early. Or maybe you're, you have that sort of teenage college grad, grad student sort of a thing where you go to bed late and get up late. Well, it turns out that those who go to bed early and get up early are the happiest among us. Uh, and this is a quite significantly different thing. Uh, and so this is a, a new finding that we have for the study. Uh, also a little bit less happy if you go to bed late and get up early, which is kind of my pattern. So. But I feel pretty happy standing in front of you. This is, this is kind of a fun thing. Well, one of the other really important things, these are kind of fun things, but something that's really important is, is, is death from heart disease. And so this is a man, uh, Jerry Morris, who did a very famous study in the 1940s in London. He started measuring the bus drivers, so the London buses, and he compared their mortality to the London bus conductors. Now, the bus conductors go up and down about 1,000 stairs a day, but in the same environment are those bus drivers, and they're sedentary the whole time. And he showed something pretty amazing which was not known at the time, that if you exercise, your mortality drops very significantly. Believe it or not, in the 1940s, we didn't know that. It used to be your doctor smoked. We didn't know smoking was bad for you. We didn't know that exercising was good for you. And this was a really important study. He died at almost 100 years old just a couple of years ago. But not before he really launched the whole area of research, and, and particularly around risk. And just to give you an idea how low fitness uh, maps to these other risk factors that you might be more familiar with, obesity, smoking, hypertension. Where do you think fitness falls in terms of the amount of risk for all-cause mortality? This is not just cardiovascular mortality, but all-cause. It's greater than all of them. And in fact, if you add up the risk from smoking, diabetes, and obesity, then the risk from low fitness is higher than all of them. So why is that relevant? Well, we can actually measure fitness now in a way that we couldn't measure it before. This is one of the ways we would measure it in hospital. This is a six-minute walk, which is simply... How far can you walk in six minutes? And we do this in hospital. This is one of the pictures of us doing it. But this is the way we do it now. You hold your iPhone, and this is some of my team doing their six-minute walk, um, and you walk up and down either inside in the corridor or outside, and there is a, a GPS-enabled uh, tracker that goes along with your steps and can tell you how far you've walked. And if you want to know where you fit in the population, then you might go to the literature and you find these studies, which are the reference values for the six-minute walk. Some, some people have done very well, managed to get almost 1,000 participants to see how far they could go in a six-minute walk. And you could plot yourself against the normal population. This is the feedback you get in, in the app. But it, in just two weeks, we managed to recruit 6,000 people to do a six-minute walk, which is almost tenfold the largest study that there was before. So we have an ability to look at fitness, something that really is important for mortality in a very large population. Uh, in, in time. So I'd just like to leave you with a sense of uh, where we're going in the future. Uh, there was a lot of talk earlier on about getting to causality in, in both the genomic session and the population health session. How do you get to that? And randomization is one of the ways to get to it. We're going to start being able to build that in to the app. We're obviously going to exp expand the sensors that are available and expand the data that can come back uh, and move much more globally in a very exciting way. 
Well, I'm just here representing a, a major team. I mentioned Mike McConnell, who's been leading this project here at Stanford. He gets enormous credit for really pushing this through. And James and the council's office is another one I'd like to, to pick up on. And then the, I uh, can't mention everyone, but the data team who've been working really, really fast to turn this around and to do the data analysis. Uh, Scotty from Star Trek appears in there uh, because Daryl didn't send me his picture in time. So i uh, also like to thank Sage Biosciences. We're moving this forward with the University of Oxford, very exciting collaboration, the American Heart Association. And finally, although they, they go under the radar and don't like us to mention their names, our friends uh, at Apple, uh, uh, we have our, our great gratitude and, and thanks as well. I do have a picture of an Apple, but it's, there it is. There you go. Thanks for uh, joining me. It's been a, a pleasure to give you.